the Nike Zoom X Invincible Run Flyknit 2 is allegedly Nike's best running shoe. It's supposed to give you more efficiency while running, make your times faster, make your joints less sore, and give you a better running economy. But we don't know if that's just all marketing jargon and positioning of a product that just has a lot of foam through the sole. So we're gonna cut it in half, run some tests on it, compare it to some other running shoes we've done in the past to really see if this is Nike's best running shoe or if it's just Nike's best marketed running shoe. This video is sponsored by Butcher Box. And if you're like me, a single guy about my age, start getting into smoking, barbecuing meats, the finer aspects of protein consumption. And the problem is if you go to any grocery store, you don't know what kind of meat you're getting and you don't know the quality, how long it's been on the shelf, how long, how many years it's been frozen for and where the meat came from. That's where Butcher Box comes in. They deliver 100% grass fed beef, free range organic chicken, pork raised crate free. I didn't even know pork pigs were put in crates to be honest and wild caught seafood with partners they really trust and are dedicated to doing the right thing. There's four different curated boxes, or you can choose to build your own and put exactly what you want in your box. In this box, we got a pretty wide variety. We got chicken, steak, salmon, scallops, shrimp, and ground beef. And the really nice thing is they're delivered to your front door in eco-friendly recycled boxing, but more importantly, you don't have to go to the store to get your meat. It just shows up at your, your front step, packed with dry ice, frozen solid, so you just put it right back into the freezer and you don't have to worry about ever even leaving your house for any reason ever again. And you're not stuck to a strict schedule. You can adjust the schedule and how frequent boxes get delivered. So if your freezer gets full, you can pause it for a little bit. If you're going on a trip, you can pause it, or you can just adjust the frequency to fit your needs. So if you need some more meat in your life, be sure to sign up via the link in my description, because if you do, you get free chicken for an entire year. You get two pounds of free range organic chicken breasts in every order for a year straight. So to get the free chicken for a year, you have to sign up before September 25th and use the link in my description so you make sure you get that and so that we get credit if you sign up so they sponsor more videos. So thanks again to Butcher Box. So to give you a brief history of Nike and their running, a lot of people, maybe maybe some of the sneakerheads know this, but a lot of people on the surface don't really understand that Nike was first and foremost a running company. They started with running shoes and that lineage is carried all the way up to the Zoom X Invincible run flying it too. And it all started in 1964 when Phil Knight and Bill Bowerman started Blue Ribbon Sports to import running shoes from J Japan to the US, specifically the A6 Onitsuki Tiger shoe. And Bill Bowerman had taken that shoe and made improvements on it and designed it to be the Aztec model running shoe over the course of their contract with Asics. And then Asics violated their exclusive distribution right contract with Blue Ribbon Sports by using other distributors. And so Blue Ribbon Sports started making their own shoes, started selling their own shoes under their own name mostly that Cortez model that Bill had designed after the ASICS model. And then in 1972, Nike was officially founded and decided to mass produce their own shoes. And then since then, Nike has been a running centered shoe. A lot of the technology was de developed for running, like the air units, all these different things over the course of time. And here's some examples of the heritage and the lineage that led up to the Zoom X. So now let's start putting this thing to the test and start going through all the details, starting with the upper first, because it is a very interesting upper, because it's a very similar knit to what we saw in the Yeezy 350s, but it's a little bit more similar to the Jordan 36 because it's a warp knit fabric or material. And the advantage of the knit upper is it allows your foot to splay out and stretch with the shoe while still holding your foot a little bit tight for support, which is perfect for a running shoe. And that's why you, all these running shoes that you see are some form of a knit upper and they stay away from leather, which is really constrictive and heavy and doesn't really flex nearly as much. It, and it, the whole idea with it is just to allow your foot to be as natural as possible because the foot evolved to be as good of a biological running platform as possible. So the idea is to keep it as natural and compression free as possible. So what makes a warp knit upper different than other knits like a weft knit? Well, a weft knit is what you see with most uh, socks and pantyhose. The knit is knit like a tube, which is also called circular knitting. And all the stitches are dependent on each other. So if one stitch breaks, the whole thing comes unraveled. And if you compare that to a warp knit, it's more of a zigzag stitch. And so if you pop one, the whole thing doesn't come unraveled. And to prove that we cut it horizontally, tried to spread those layers and see if it would come unraveled raveled. We also cut it vertically, try to do the same thing, try to split those, those threads apart and get it to kind of unravel like a pantyhose would. But as you can see, it doesn't really do that. And that's the advantage of this type of knit. It's a lot stronger. It's a lot more abrasion resistant, not necessarily in the way that it's going to prevent abrasion, but once you get heavy abrasion, the whole shoe isn't compromised. And while we were at it, we wanted just to test how strong these eyelets are because it's just those two layers of material with a little layer of a thin eyelet. So we hooked it up to the engine crane and it surprised me. It took 101.8 pounds to pop through those eyelets, which isn't nearly as good as we've seen in some of the other boots and shoes, 
but for just a simple knit upper, it surprised me how good it did. And here's some results from some other eyelet tests that we've done. So in comparison, they, they do they do fine. They're, they're not the best, not the worst, good enough for a running shoe. And then there is one odd spot on this shoe. There's this little retaining like plate at the back of the heel that is a really soft, like almost like rubber. And I'm not really sure what this does. I, I'm, I was wondering if it's just to help prevent this heel portion from over compressing and curling up, if it gives it some rigidity or if it's just a straight gimmick to make it look more technologically advanced and there was some more little gimmicky things on there. And then if we move to the outsole, this is a pretty interesting thing that also might be a gimmick, but if you notice there's these little nubs on there for traction, but they, they vary in size and location and density throughout the entire outsole. And that's because it's their data driven traction, which means Nike used pressure points to space out the traction of this shoe to make it as grippy as possible while still maintaining a really thin but durable outsole. Does it actually do anything? That's a tough one to test even with garage science, but I do think that there probably is a little added benefit from having in certain high pressure spots, more traction. It's probably an innovation for innovation's sake. It probably doesn't do a whole lot for you, but I still think there is some real world data to back this up. And then to the construction of this shoe, if we pull out this insole, it's a very unique construction because most of these shoes we've seen, they're either a uh, slip lasted construction or the upper is tucked all the way underneath with a seam going down the middle. With this one, it's still strobel stitch, but you can see instead of a full layer of, of fabric underneath, it's just like half an inch of fabric that wraps all the way around that's glued to the foam underneath and strobel stitched to the upper. So why would they do that? What are the advantages they're trying to get from this type of construction? Well, our assumption is that, that you're trying to get as close to this high-tech foam as possible while getting all the responsiveness and all the, the characteristics out of this foam without covering it with another sheet of material. And Colin had a good example of what this might be for. It'd be like if you're putting a, a plywood sheet on top of a trampoline, as you jump on that plywood, that weight is gonna be distributed across the entire trampoline or at least the size of the plywood versus if without the plywood, it's a lot more focused and it's a lot more precise pressure on the trampoline. The idea would be the same thing here. And then to the biggest selling point, the, sh the thing that really makes this shoe what it is, the midsole, this big fat slab of foam. This foam was developed using the same materials as the Vaporfly 4%, the shoe that helped break the sub two hour marathon. That name 4% comes from the fact that this foam allegedly makes you 4% more efficient while running. And there is some data to back this up because in their analysis of half a million marathons and half marathon race times posted to Strava, reporters Kevin Queeley and Josh Katz confirmed that this foam does look like it makes you 4% more efficient while running. So to add a little garage science to that data, we rigged up our bar drop test, which, you know, when doing this, we realized it might be a little bit heavy for some of these, these boots and shoes, because you can see we blew through the insole and there's a giant void in the heel. And we didn't want to just test this shoe. We wanted to give you a baseline and a, and a few other uh, points of data from other running shoes. So we did the converse to give us a just a simple baseline. It bounced up 3.25 inches. Next, we went to the Hoka's that bounced all the way up to eight inches. Then we did the On Cloud Monsters that went 7.75 inches. And then finally to the Zoom X Flyknits, it only bounced up six inches. So it didn't perform quite as well as some of the other ones, but I also think this is a different type of responsive foam because it is a really, it's almost like a flaky foam. When you get to the inside of it, it's just, it's a really soft and light and almost crumbly foam. And so based off that data and how this foam feels on the inside, we wanted to run another test similar to the bar drop test to give us another, another example of how this foam reacts under certain impact. So we invented a new test that's similar to the bar drop test, but instead of this 35 pound bar completely demolishing the outsole and the insole and everything in between, we got this test that was designed for testing screen protectors, or, or maybe not testing, but demonstrating screen protectors and phones to see how this foam reacts to a little bit lighter weight impact and rebound test. Because it's the first time we did it, we didn't really know exactly what we're doing and how to, to do this in the right way. So we did three different versions of the test. We did it on the outsole, we did it on the insole, and we did it on the inside with the insole removed. So the converse, it bounced up 3.9 inches, and then the insole, because it's permanent, we only did the one test, it's 11.9 inches. The Hoka's were 19.1, with the insole 12.4, and the outsole is 18.1 inches. The Ons were 20.5 inches, with the insole 20.5 as well, and the outsole 16.4, but also those Ons are kind of hard to test because they have the little nubs. And so how did the Zoom X do? Well, it bounced back up an astonishing 28.3 inches, the insole did 22, and the outsole,
Russell did 15.1. So kind of some data all over the place. Here's the averages and here's the information just laid out so you can see exactly what all those numbers were and what they meant. So I was really surprised that this shoe didn't win across the board and it, that it performed the worst on the outsole. I'm not exactly sure why, maybe it has something to do with the responsiveness of the rubber and not really, maybe the, the midsole doesn't matter as much when you're dropping it from the outsole only. But either way, I still think that's enough information to back up some of their claims and really shows that this foam really is a lightweight responsive foam. And just because we can and it's fun to burn stuff, we also just burned this outsole to see how it reacted because it is such a lightweight foam. And as you can see, once that initial shell is broken, that whole thing just starts to light up. And I think it's because there's a lot less material to air ratio in this foam compared to a lot of the other foams we've tested. Now let's get this thing cut in half, see if there's any sort of shank on the inside, like the Vaporfly 4%, and if it's just all foam and how much foam there actually is. So now let's cut it in half. All right, we got it cut in half, so let's see what's inside of the shoe and what makes it Nike's best running shoe. So let's see what's inside. So just an ungodly amount of foam in this shoe. That's by far the most foam we've ever seen in a shoe. If we take a measurement at the highest point, it's one and a half inches of foam. And there's clearly no shank inside of here like the, the shoe that broke the two hour marathon mark. And the outsole is really, really thin. And so really the shoe is one of the more simple shoes we've cut apart. And I think that's part of the design. I think the simplicity is part of the gimmick of this shoe because there's no visible air units, there's no visible tech. You know, you've got some interesting things going on with this like plate that I don't really think does a whole lot. But the simplicity itself I feel like is the is the selling point of the shoe. It's like all those cliche design sayings like good design is as little design as possible. Good design is isn't obvious. Good design is simple and that's why it's complicated. You know they're cliches but they are kind of true to some degree. And this shoe, I think it's so successful because they took a running shoe, boiled it down to just the essential components and made those as performance based as possible. Nike's known for all their fancy tech, the visible tech, all these things that improve the technology of shoes, but their highest performing and best running shoe is their simplest shoe. And I, I love that aspect of it. So let me know what you guys think and what your experiences are in these shoes. And we got a few other foam base knit running shoes coming up. So if you like this video, support it so we can afford to do the other ones. And just a reminder on the opposite end of running shoes, we've got that Whites collab coming up. Be sure to sign up for the limited edition email list because there's only 200 of those boots compared to the 500 we've done with previous collabs. And thank you guys for everything you do. See ya.